It has a diversity of wildlife. There are more than 400 species of vertebrate that can be found right here in the state. And it's really due to the state of Jersey's um, location. Okay. Uh, bear with me a minute. It's not changing screen since we started to record. There we go. So New Jersey lies at the southernmost edge of the range called northern species. Um, deer, bear, black bear. But they're at the northern edge of the range of the southern species, which could be skunks, possums, um, up till recently. I wouldn't tell you this is true. But a porcupine also came into my custody uh, a couple days ago. So we are right at the cusp of the various species based on temperature and weather. That fact combined with the hundreds of miles of coastline and the five physiod physiographic regions and the Pine Barrens combines this board of diverse abundance wildlife. We have every kind of system. We have dry, arid areas, somewhat like deserts. We have the highlands, we have river basins, we have swamp area. Um, it's very diversified. So we have an abundance of wildlife and they survive quite well here. The Division of Fish and Wildlife is responsible for all the wildlife in New Jersey. That includes the goal of protecting and managing our population to make sure that we balance it and know that if a certain species was going into a distress situation, we could do things to help implement that species to survive. This work has restored the populations of wild turkey, peregrine falcon, as well as bald eagles and osprey. And I know people call me all the time, I see a bald eagle. That is a wonderful, healthy, indicator that our environment's doing well. Beavers, again, are widespread. They can be complicated, but they are part of our indigenous species. Usually you find out when someone's property gets flooded that I have to go interfere in the building of a dam by a beaver. There are coyotes. There's even bobcat that range across our state. Just because you don't see them doesn't mean they're not there. It means that, in my words, they're good union bobcats. They survive at night and they don't interfere with our enjoyment of our property. Many species are just simply doing their thing. They're not really trying to hurt you or interfere, but if you present them with a place to be or food source, they will cause you a problem. Every species has a vital role. If one species is rendered extinct due to some imbalance, it will definitely have a cascading effect on the rest of the species in our area. Conversely, if a species become overabundant, it also will have a significant effect on our environment. I think right off the top, I would say deer are definitely having a significant effect on our environment right now. But every, every species has a role in the balance of our ecosystem. We have coyote, fox, bear, bobcat. When they first showed up, everybody was amazed and loved it. Now, when we see more of them, people become concerned. Um, coyotes, fox, bear, and bobcat are carnivores. But they're also, many of them will eat other things like veg vegetables and any kind of product or waste they can find. With no predators to control our population and alter feeding behaviors, behaviors, certain species will degrade and overrun its habitat. Well, we kind of have that with the deer right now. Honestly, the um, only effect that we have on deer is the car accidents. We take out quite a few with car accidents across the country. Um, rodents, nobody likes rodents, but they actually serve a purpose. Um, and they also are a food source for many animals besides mammals, but birds of prey, even amphibians, snakes, everything has a balance. If we didn't have the rodents, those animals would then in, inter, uh, like interfere in our enjoyment of our property by being out all the time looking for food. The fact that they have the availability of rodents makes them a healthy population. Not anything to be really concerned of unless, again, overabundance. If you have a lot of rats on your property, we usually can figure out exactly why they're there. Snakes, nobody, well, I won't say nobody. I'd say 90% of the population hates snakes. Mm -hmm but they keep the rodent numbers down. They, they definitely serve a purpose in our environment. Um, and most times snakes are quite peaceful as long as we don't interfere with them. Bats, bats cannot contract the West Nile disease by eating infected insects. So they are a pretty survi healthy surviving species, but then we had the white nose disease. But bats can kill an active, healthy adult bat can eat over 10,000 mosquitoes a night. They also take out the beetles, the moth, the leaf hoppers. These are things that are destroying our trees and our foliage. So the bats are beneficial. Sometimes people think they're creepy and they can carry disease, but they have a balance in our environment and we should make sure we don't do anything to harm them. 
Wildlife populations have increased significantly over the last 30 years. I've been doing this for about 35 years, both in Bergen County and Morris County. And things I did not deal with 30 years ago were in 1988, bear, deer, coyote, bobcat, turkey vultures, fox, rattlesnake, feral cats, beaver, and copperheads. Now we didn't have to deal with them because there wasn't an overabundance. Um, you know, if, if we have to deal with them, we do what we can, but we don't try to displace them and remove them from the environment. We usually try to educate people that these species are here and that they belong here. They are indigenous, but we want to make sure that they're not causing a dangerous situation for people. Um, years ago, if we saw a couple of geese in a field, we all, wow, look at them. Now when you see geese in a field, a task force is created to make sure the geese leave. So things we used to think were amazing, they're every day to us. And as much as most people say, I'm living in Bergen County, I shouldn't have to deal with these things. You're living in a healthy environment in Bergen County, and that's why you are dealing with these things. We recently had a bear show up in East Rutherford, and you would think that, I guess the Pope had arrived because they called everybody out. And all we had to do was make some noise, and the bear went out and disappeared up the river, up the Pacific River. So again, it, it's alarming, but it is not unusual. It's not one of the situations where you say it doesn't belong here. It does belong here because it is here. Everybody tells me we are building in all of their natural habitats. We are definitely building in the natural habitats. But despite that fact, the deer population, the bear population, the coyote population have increased, which means there's a food source for all of them, which would be rodents and small animals. So it's balancing itself out. And as long as we can let it balance itself out, it will. It's when we interfere, when we decide, oh, look at that cute fox with those babies. Let's put out some chicken. Not a good idea. When animals become used to eating from humans and human scent is on the food, they become less fearful of humans. And that's when we have dangerous encounters. Why is everybody making such a fuss about wildlife? Well, there is wildlife attacks on pets and humans. Um, more on pets because they tend to be more curious and rush into those animals. Most humans have enough common sense to back off, but people have been bitten by wildlife, whether it's a close encounter that neither one of them counted on and the animal reacts by biting, it's still dangerous because we worry about disease control. There are abnormal numbers of various species. As I said, some species have overwhelmed our area and we can only hope for balances to be developed, but it's going to have to be a group effort by everyone. Property damage. I hear about at least 10 times a month. Someone tells me that the deer have decimated my property and my, my foliage and my plantings, or that the geese are on my lawn and they're making it turn brown from their droppings. People get very upset by that. Unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do from the animal control basis. We can give you advice, but there is no way an animal that wants to get in your garden is going to be kept out of that garden. They're very clever. We worry about the Lyme's disease, toxoplasmosis, rabies, things like that. They're all very true um, fears, but if we use caution, we eliminate our encounters with animals and we use good judgment in going out our back door, look first, turn on a light, we probably won't encounter, encounter the animals that we're worried about. As far as Lyme's disease, it is tick-borne. It can come in on deer, but it also could come in on your dog. So we have to use good sense and use the proper products to protect our pets from the various um, ticks and be flies and mosquitoes out there that can carry diseases that can make them make them sick. And there is an increase, increase in the cases of rabies that have turned up across the state. We probably don't go through a whole week without two or three animals having to be tested for rabies, mostly wildlife. But the bottom line is we have to do it because in humans, there's no rabies vaccine like you have in your pets. We have to make sure you're safe. And the only way you can make sure you're safe is make sure that the animals around you are healthy and safe. So I hear all the time, but I'm only feeding a couple of cats and birds. And you know, there's a few cats in this picture. There's some birds. There's multiple bird feeders. You have to understand what you're doing on your property is affecting your neighbors. And it's usually not always in the best circumstance. So if you're putting out cat food, bird food, and bird feeders, you have to understand there's other problems developing. Everybody always tells me, I always put my garbage in the dumpster, but if your dumpsters look like these, then you haven't done an effective job in keeping wildlife from getting into dumpsters and can garbage cans. These are pictures from places I've gone right around here, and I'm telling you that it happens every day. We have the problem of dumpsters not being closed, garbage cans left open, um, 
your kids play out in the yard and you leave food behind and it creates a problem for everyone. So this is what really is happening. That little bit of cat food you left out, raccoons and skunks are eating it. They're a vector. Matter of fact, raccoon is the number one vector for rabies, skunks number two, and feral cat is the number three vector for rabies in the state of New Jersey. And that's scary because most of these cats are being fed by some human who's touching the dishes. They put the food out, the cat eats from it, raccoon eats from it, skunk eats from it. The saliva from these animals can contaminate each other and it's dangerous. Then we have the other dangerous situation, the bear with the, with the jar on his head. That's from going in someone's garbage. But we can't let that bear walk around like that because someone approaches him, he could hurt him. So we do have to intercede and we have to get fish and wildlife up here with tranquilizers so we can get the container off the bear's head. It's dangerous, but it's also cruel to let the animal die that way. You see the squirrel at the feeder. You see the deer at the feeder. Well, I'm only putting out some bird seed, but you're feeding other animals you didn't intend on feeding. And the more use they become to the food with human scent, the more they're going to approach humans and put themselves in a situation where we have to intercede and remove them. You see pets being attacked by coyotes. We're getting this all the time. Bears going into people's properties. And if you happen to leave your garage door or shed doors open regularly, you're going to have part of the problem. We've gone into numerous garages and sheds where we've had to chase a bear out. Of. We've even had to chase bears out of store, stores that left their back doors open. It's not easy. There's property damage done. So closing your house, securing your doors, securing your dumpsters, taking care of making sure you're, you're doing better practices to prevent the animals from entering your home and your property is the easiest solution. As you see in this case, the, the geese. A goose will protect its nest, and that poor bicyclist just made the mistake of going past the nest. And honestly, fortunately, he stayed on the bike, but we've had people call us with injuries and pecking wounds and stuff, and it is scary. I don't think a goose is going to hurt you badly, but it is going to scare you. People fall over running away from them, and it's disturbing to have something like the size of that goose jump out from a bush and attack you. As with the turkey, we have a lot more turkeys in Bergen County now, and honestly, it's it's crazy how many calls I get a day. They're attacking people, just running up at them, especially during breeding season, or pulling up to cars, stop the traffic lights, and pecking the sides of the cars. They're not after the cars. They see their reflection in the shine of the cars, so they think they're pecking at another turkey, when in fact they're destroying your car, and we can't get them to go away because they think they're with a flock of turkeys because your car is so nice and shiny. We can't just tranquilize all the wildlife and take them anywhere else. It's a violation of our disease control policies throughout the country. Tranquilizers can take up to four to 10 minutes to take effect. So a drug animal is running around for four to 10 minutes before we can locate it and catch it. Many times when we tranquilize an animal that is not up a tree or cornered where it can't move out, uh, we lose them and the drug wears off and they're back and running again. And no one else. Um, needs or wants these animals in the neighborhood. I hear all the time, why don't we round up all the deer, put them in a trailer or a train and take them out where the hunters are? Well, it'd be a great idea, but we cannot do that because diseases from our animals on our state probably would infect the animals in other states and nobody really needs deer. Across the country, they're breeding and populating at a great number. The morbidity rate is very high. Um, Again, when we tranquilize an animal, they don't take tranquilizers as well. You hear about the dangers of, youth, of um, being, tra uh, being anesthetized. It's the same with animals. We could use the recommended dose of a tranquilizer and half the time the animals will die from handling. It's because of their, their fear and their flight patterns that when we tranquilize them, sometimes they just have heart attacks and die on us. So it's not a happy ending to give a, an animal a drug and try to move it around. And if we take an animal to an unfamiliar area, they won't know where to find the food sources or shelter and most likely will move into people's properties or into people's structures. So tranquilizing and removing animals is not the answer for, this, for our area. So is the animal truly sick? I get calls all the time. I think I have a sick animal. Well, there's some questions you can ask yourself that will confirm whether the animal is sick or healthy. And they're easy questions. An animal's appearance. Does the animal look healthy? Is it well-groomed? Does it look well-fed? Does it act with good potty posture? Good potty posture, walking in a normal pattern. That is probably a healthy animal. Across it, uh, or in comparison, is the fur unkept and dirty? Most animals are pretty clean. They keep themselves clean and clean themselves regularly. So if their fur looks unkept or dirty, more than likely there's something going on. 
Does it appear as if it's drunk or uncoordinated? Most animals with distemper and rabies will walk like a drunken person. They'll cir circle around trees. You'll even see them biting the tires of cars. They don't have their normal instincts because they are sick and distemper and rabies is a neurological disease. So they will be acting in this drunk manner. Um, we don't approach these animals. You could call the police if an animal is truly staggering around or walking in circles and they will have us come. But if the animal looks in that appearance, if you want to stay away from it, don't think you can help them. We get more bite cases from somebody who picked up an animal and was going to take them to an animal hospital. Very few animal hospitals in our area will take in wildlife because it's a disease issue for their facility. Most people that work at animal hospitals, surprisingly, are not vaccinated against rabies. Where people like myself that work in animal control, we get pre-vaccinated. It doesn't save us from anything, but it helps us if we have exposure and we can get quicker treatment that way. Activity. What is the animal doing? Does it move and react with purpose and attention? If it's moving right towards your swimming pool and drinking from the side of your pool, you're right. It's chlorinated water. It's not a good idea, but to the animal, that is a water source. So don't think that that's one of the things we're worried about. That's a normal behavior. If it climbs a tree, we get a lot of calls. I've got a raccoon that climbed 40 feet into my tree, probably lives there. We have calls about deer. They're laying under my tree and when I approach them, they don't move. Well, they pretty much think they're well disguised and you really don't see them. We get a lot this time of the year and the last two weeks, especially baby deer laying under bushes. Well, he's been there for four or five hours and the mother hasn't come by. The mother's close by. She puts the baby deer there. Understand that deer, when they're born, have no scent. So as long as that baby deer doesn't move, predators can't find it. Except for us humans, most animals will pass it right by because it doesn't have the common scent they're looking for for something they would like to eat. So the mother deer put them there and leave them there. So it's not anything you need to interfere with. Normally our answer is, let's wait 24 hours and see if it's still there. Usually, as soon as night falls, the mother deer comes, feeds it, and moves it to another safe location for the next day. So they're healthy animals. We just have to understand the animal's actions are normal and not always think we can solve the problem. We get a lot of people like to pet baby deer. It's not a good idea. The mother will still accept it. It's nothing about the scent, but you're teaching that deer not to fear humans, and that's a problem. So is it just sleeping in the middle of the yard, or is it wandering aimlessly? If you have an animal out in the open just laying there, there's a problem, especially if it appears to be sleeping. Animals usually put themselves in a safe position when they lay down or rest. So if it's laying in the middle of the yard and it appears to be sleeping, you need to let us know about that animal. Is it wandering aimlessly? As I said, walking in circles, walking into trees, walking into something, walking right out into traffic. That is a problem. Does it appear to be injured or have paralysis of the back legs? That's one of the major indicators of diseases. They can't move their back legs. That could be distemper. That could be rabies. We wouldn't know without testing, but we should definitely intervene and prevent that animal from dying a slow, painful death. Attitude. is How is the animal responding to your presence? Is the animal alert and react by avoiding you? That's normal animal behavior. If you corner it, it's still going to go after you. But if it's just walking away from you, it's not something we're very concerned about. Does it stand its ground in your presence, but then run away when you back off? We tell people, if you're approaching wildlife, whether you didn't see it or not, you get out of your car, you walk up, you see a raccoon, more than likely, if you say, okay, buddy, I'm going to give you space, and you back up a couple feet, the raccoon will take off. But while you're approaching it, it is going to keep its eyes very much focused on you because it wants to know where the danger is. So if you back off and it runs away, then it's a healthy animal. Or does it not care about you or your pet? It sits there and pretends it can't see you. Well, probably can't because with December and rabies, there's a certain amount of blindness. Um, it, you're, no wildlife will usually let a pet approach it, but some animals would let a dog approach it where they would run from a human. Um, does it always make it sick? No. It's best to control our pets. As I tell everybody, I never let my dogs outside without flipping on a light and looking around because I don't know what's in my yard. Animals can climb fences, dig under fences. Deer can jump up to six to eight feet over a fence. So you don't want to cause that conflict. It's best to be the smart person and look first and check your property. Uh, does it attack pets and people unprovoked? We've had these situations. And the best thing I say is get away from the animal. Try to maybe go to a safe place in the house behind a door and watch it and locate the, or call the police department. Usually they will come and locate the animal and keep an eye on it so we can get there and get it. 
we're not sitting down the street from you all the time, but we get there pretty quick. But your police department is on the road in your town 24 hours a day. So there would be the ones that could definitely make a visual contact with this animal and keep it in their vision so I can get there or one of my officers can get there and secure the animal. So if the attitude is that the animals act normally and avoid you, it's great. If the animal is not trying to avoid humans, we have a problem and we need to address it. So dealing with wildlife in your neighborhood, they really, very few encounters are the animal's fault. Usually when we have an encounter where an animal attacked a human, they cornered them, they walked into the garage on them, um, they left the door open, the animal gets in the house and now feels trapped. But the animals in our area, for the most part, are pretty human wise. I've actually seen deer stopping in the streets now at the curb and looking both ways. I can't even get my kids to do that when they were little, but the deer seem to understand that they need to go watch out for traffic. So animals have learned to adapt to the environment they're living in. What we need to learn is to adapt to the animals living in our environment and to be smarter than them, because we are. We are absolutely smarter than animals if we take the time to think. We would be aware of our surroundings. If we were walking through a city street, as on the left-hand side, we would look ahead before we would force an encounter with somebody that might harm us. A little kid running ahead of you on a trail up in the Rampo Mountains is not a safe thing. When your children run ahead of you, they may encounter an animal that you would have probably, if you were closer to them, kept it from happening. So with the two scenarios in front of you, we would definitely be on alert on the left-hand side, or at least I would, I'm not very familiar with the city, but I would wonder who's in that alleyway. Is there an escape path? How do I get around? When I'm walking around hiking in the mountains around here, Rampo Mountains up Skyline Drive, and I have my grandkids with me, I don't let them run ahead of me. I make them stay by me. It's safety for them, it's safety for me. I wouldn't want an animal get to be between myself and my grandchildren. So know the environment you're in. That's not unsafe being on these trails and walking, but right around that curve could be another animal. So we always try to be a little smarter than the animals. Leave them the room to escape. Don't rush up on them. If they have young with them, they're not gonna be able to react quickly and they're gonna feel that you're endangering their young. So this is a very important fact not to startle or run up on animals. Millions of people throughout the world are bitten by animals each year. It happens. About 90% of these bites are caused by dogs and cats though, not wildlife. Infections are the most complicated complication of every bite. Um, cat bites actually um, seem to get infected because they heal quickly, but then there's infection underneath that didn't actually drain before they healed because the bite is so small, their teeth are thin and sharp. Children are the most frequently bitten victims, and that's with mostly domestic animals, but we do have some children that get bit by wildlife because they see something cute. To them, it's a, a moving stuffed animal and they tend to react to it. A large percentage of these bites are to the upper extremity of children because they tend to lead with their face, lean over. Um, in dog cases, most children want to hug and kiss a dog. It's the best thing you can do with children is to teach them to never lead with their face, never bend over. We even teach adults and animal control officers, don't lead with your face into a cage where an animal is. They bite your hand, it's going to be bad, it's going to hurt, but they get your eyes, you're going to be blind. And it only takes a second and animals have very swift reactions. So don't be the victim, think before you do these things. Never leave children unattended in your yard. And I hear about, oh, we worry about the coyotes and the foxes and the bear. Um, mm -hmm. children, children can and are attacked by just neighborhood dogs being left alone. And by children, I mean in children of the eight, eight, nine that don't have the concept to run away. They see a dog, many children are animal lovers. And I see it all the time. They wanna tell me the stories about the, the dogs they saw and the cats they saw and things like that. Their instinct is to love the animal. They don't have the natural fear that someone a little older might have. So always think, I would never leave a children unattended in the yard. And it doesn't have anything to do with bears, coyotes, foxes, or anything else you imagine out there. It has more to do with the other dangers that are out there, um, mostly from domestic animals or even people in their neighborhood. So you really want to be cautious and use good judgment. So to avoid the confrontations with wildlife, we should look ahead. As you see, the person walking down the path sees the bear walking towards them. My first instinct is to be loud and make noise. Let that bear know I'm coming. It's the same deal with coyotes. I've yet to see a coyote that didn't react to noise. We carry noise makers. They're little air horns you can use in boats. They're great. They're small. They fit in your pocket. They work on wildlife and domestic animals. If you have a dog charging up to you and you blow that horn, you're going to get that second you need 
to get away or to divert the animal from coming at you. A whistle, a bell, anything that will startle the animal. They're used to us talking. They might be used to us, our, the way we breathe, the way we talk when we're walking along, but they are not used to the, the sound of a whistle or a bell going off. Those will distract animals very quickly. And even when we're moving bears, and we do have to move bears out of areas sometimes, we use the noisemakers, we use whistles, we use bells, we shake our jacket over a head. In the animal kingdom, the biggest is the winner. There's very few times confrontations actually go forward between two animals because they puff up and they look really big. My favorite thing to do when I see wildlife somewhere I'm going, whether I'm out horseback riding on my horse on the trails or hiking, is to take my jacket by the corners, put it over my head so I look like I have a giant wingspan and yell. When I do that, the animals tend to run away because I just won. I'm the biggest. When I'm on a six foot horse, I already won. Just having the horse stand still and the animal make an eye contact, wow, that's a really big creature, and they walk away. And we don't chase, pursue, we just simply go a different direction. That's safe, intelligent behavior around wildlife. There are some exceptions to the noise thing. Snakes do not react to noise. They react to the, they stick their tongue out and vibration, scent, that's all comes back to them through their tongue. They don't really hear well. They react by knowing what's around them. On the left, we have a rattlesnake. On the right, we have a black rat snake. I will tell you of the two, the rattlesnake is more hesitant to strike than that rat snake or a black water snake. They are very aggressive. And honestly, um, what we see a lot around here in New Jersey, they're great hunters. If you have one in your yard, it means there's a food source. If you have a rattlesnake, it means there's a food source in a body of water. So always think that although there's a snake on your property, it may not be a bad thing. You may have a chipmunk or mouse or a vermin problem that you don't even realize you have yet. But the fact that they're there means there's a food source. So don't be... Um, quick to, I know a lot of people tell, oh, I chopped his head off and stuff. You Now you're causing an imbalance again. Let's try to think better. Try not to harass these animals. Try not to encounter them. When you're walking through a field, always look where you're walking. Um, I know a lot of fields have high grass in them, and I'm great with carrying a walking stick and kind of brushing the grass ahead of me when I'm going through high grass, because I don't know what's under the grass, but I should know if I'm going to be responsible for my safety and the safety of others. Never turn and run from an animal. You won't win that race. You have two legs, they have four. They run all day long. They're like marathon runners. So no matter how fast you are, you won't outrun an animal. They can run faster and their endurance is usually a lot more than ours. Most animals won't do more than a couple strides of charging at you to do what we call a bluff charge. Bears, deer, coyotes, they do a bluff charge to try to say, hey, I'm tough. And if you start running, they'll start chasing you. It's prey drive. Every animal has it. Um, so you definitely don't want to run away from an animal. You want to keep an eye on that animal. You want to get loud. You want to walk away carefully. You don't want to throw things at them or anything to harass them. You want to allow them to leave peacefully, and you're going to leave peacefully. And in most times you do that, the outcome will be a good one. So really, just running is never a good idea, even with domestic animals. I mean, I've had cats chase me when I go into someone's yard because I get startled, I turn, and the cat comes forward until I turn and face them. So understand, in the animal kingdom, if I turn my back, I became a victim to them, and they will chase you. Maybe it's harmless, maybe it's playful, but you really don't want to start that practice. So always just keep an eye on the animal that you have worried about and try not to encounter it, but walk, walk away, away, making noise, singing a song, whatever you got to do. And teaching your children these same concepts will keep them safe also. So avoid cornering an animal. Never make eye contact. If you look directly at an animal, you're challenging them. Any animal, even a rabbit, if you look it in the eye, it'll kind of look back at you and it will run because you've encountered it. You've made that contact. But we don't need to do that. We don't need to dominate any species out there. Make noise. We are the noisiest species in the world and animals expect that from us. If you come up silent and quiet, they don't expect that from you. So make noise. Back away slowly. Don't run. Don't turn your back. If the animal's coming at you, you should know that. You should use whatever you can to keep it away, your jacket, uh, anything. Hey, in a fix, throw your phone. I see many people with animal encounters that are videotaping it. Can you tell me anything you don't know? No. Hello? 
I'm sorry. I thought we had a problem. I see people videotaping things instead of trying to get out of the area. If you're encountering a wild animal, count on the fact the wild animal does not want you there and wants to do everything it can to avoid you. You need the animals for balance. Oh, okay. Okay. So never turn your back on an animal. Always know where they are and always know where you're going. Look for your escape route because they're looking for theirs. And allow the animal the room to escape. If you're between two buildings, go the other way. Let the animal have the escape. If you happen to encounter an animal where you have it caught up between Water a fence, snake that are more prone to attack you than a rattlesnake. Rattlesnake is shyer about attacking. What are they poisonous? What, what's wrong yes. with the black snake? Black water snake, not that black garter snake that we had. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> oh, Ted Ross killed one. That was not a garter snake. Yes, it was. You know, we'll probably do comments. We'll probably yeah. do comments at the end of this. Please, everyone, mute yourselves. Okay. So again, allow the animal room to escape. If you happen upon an animal where you've already cornered it, just quickly try to get out of that situation. Even just move to one side, they will shoot past you. Most times they'll go right past you, they won't encounter you, they may bluff charge you, they may even hiss at you, but give them room to escape. And of course, they talk about taking animals away, they're against it naturally. Are there any questions that I can answer now? somebody else's place. Oh, no. You're also like, breaking up a family. Just like you said. What? You're breaking up a family. She, she could be a, it could be a female. Rosalie, please mute yourself. Everyone hears what you're saying. Okay. At this point, if there are any questions or concerns, you probably could ask me them right now. But you'd have to unmute yourself first. Carol, there, there are a, a couple of questions in the chat. Um, okay, I'm not seeing that yet. Do you see, okay, I can read them to you if you'd like. I'm gonna try open in the gallery, which might cover my screen, but let me give that a try. No, I'm still not seeing it, Greg. Okay, um, so I can read them to you. Uh, are we doing anything with birth control measures to limit the deer population? Okay, well, we did have the experience in the borough of Saddle River where a veterinarian decided he would donate his time and a few residents donated money to try a birth control methods, whether it be prophylactic, which is new, meaning food left outside for the animals with the drugs in it, or actually physically catching and neutering the deer. Our experience is, first of all, Fish and Wildlife will not permit it on a mass permit. They'll give a permit for one deer at a time. It's a silly process. When we're going through the Saddle River process, we did three years of discussion and oversight. They actually did helicopter surveillance at night with thermal imaging cameras. Saddle River is about two miles square. In that thermal imaging, they found over 200 deer. The carrying capacity for most areas in New Jersey in a one mile area is about 30 deer without affecting the environment. They found over 200 deer in a two mile area in one night of counting. So they needed to do something so they, they did apply to the state. The vet was willing. He actually even volunteered my services. He said, Carol Tyler is a great friend of mine and she'll help me catch these animals and spay and neuter them. But the state knocked the plan down and even the vet in the end said it wasn't a feasible plan. Animals don't do well under anesthesia and we don't know what the effect of spay and neutering deer would be. Would they turn into cattle and stay on people's lawns? Because they don't have the drive that's forcing them to move along. Thank you. Next, next question. Can you tell us about voles? How do we keep them out of our gardens? I'm a terrible gardener. Everything I own will die. And I have asked people that are gardeners what they do about voles. And they said that may, mostly commercial products that are out there, I guess sticks, things that go into the ground. I can't tell you about my experience because I've never had to deal with them. But if you go to our website, there's a link to the Department of Fish and Wildlife. They have a whole section on voles and garden pest. Okay, thank you. Um, can we do a limited cull of deer with professional bow and arrow like they did, like they do in Saddle River? That would be up to your mayor, your council. There'd have to be studies. Fish and Wildlife will actually help you do this, um, but there's mixed mixed opinions on this. Um, it's up to each community. 
honestly, in my opinion, it should be up to the county and the county should be addressing this issue as a whole for all our communities, but they seem to leave it up to each municipality. Um, Saddle River, if you ask some people it was successful, you ask some people they feel it was overkill or something like that, but it's up to each community to do what they need to do. I'm just there to advise in any way I can and help. Uh, next question is, what is the best way to react to a black versus a brown bear? Well, we don't have brown bears in New Jersey. They're all black bears, despite the fact that sometimes their color comes out brown. Um, but the best way to react to a black bear, depending on the space between you, if the bear and you are just a few feet apart, um, get loud, but walk away. Don't turn and run. Back up. Find a point of safety. If you have space to react between you and the bear, say 10 or 12 yards, make noise. The bear may do a fake bluff charge. Very few black bears have been involved in um, dangerous encounters. I know the one in West Milford four or five years ago, but actually through investigation, they found out the bear was being taunted by that group of youths. They had food with them. They had thrown food at the bear. Then they kept walking. The biggest mistake they did was breaking off and everybody going their own direction. It left the victim for the bear to go after. Fish and Wildlife had done autopsies on the bear and found a lot of food that was consistent with the food in the backpack of the victim. So they don't say that was a predatory bear, but the bear might have been instigated by the actions of the humans. Bear tend to run away. Trust me, I have to get up close and personal with these things. I've never had one decide it was going to fight with me. They always run, which is how we get them up a tree so that Fish and Wildlife can intervene with tranquilizers and move them to a better location. Those are the only questions in the chat. So if anybody has any other questions, they should uh, unmute themselves and ask the questions now. Hello, uh, I have groundhogs uh, in my yard. Are they bad for, for you know, for the property? Uh, and how should I deal with it? Well, they're only bad if you want to have a successful garden. So I would tell you groundhogs live in communal groups. Whereas most species chase their young away, groundhogs embrace everybody staying together and working as a community to survive. Unfortunately, if you have one groundhog, you probably have 10 or 15. And if they're in a good environment, they have several holes or several tunnels that are interlocking. Sometimes we find tunnel systems through several properties. The best thing I can say is if you have a ground prog groundhog issue and you're trying to have a garden, good fencing with solid bottom or rock at the bottom or netting at the bottom will help you keep those animals out of your garden. Uh, the only other way would be to hire a pest control company to trap, but lately the state of New Jersey has pro put prohibitions on them, so if they trap the animal, the animal usually loses. Translocating is not really a feasible answer because the distance you have to take the animal, you're probably presenting disease into a new area that they don't want it. So with groundhogs, we tell them fencing, diverting, cut off the food supply. If they don't have the food, they will not stay. They will find a more fruitful area to live. Um, we have a couple more questions, Carol. Um, okay. What type of bear sprays do you recommend? Egg solids, pepper, et cetera? Greg, I'm, I'm sorry, I meant deer sprays for vegetables. Oh, deer. deer, not not bear. Okay. Deer sprays. Well, in all honesty, um, we found over the years, there are certain products that do work for a period of time. There were also certain plants that used to work for a period of time. But as the population increases and the food sources become less available to these deer, they'll eat plants that they've never eaten before. And sprays and certain products are only as good as the application you do. If you apply it on Monday and it pours on Wednesday, you need to reapply it on Thursday. It's only as good as the user who's using it. Now, I see a lot of people, one, one group will say this product's good. The other group will say this product's good. Um, whatever works for you. Years ago, we used to recommend noisy moving things. Um, the best thing I ever used when I actually tried to grow tomatoes, which was really kind of didn't work well, but I got some tomatoes out of the garden, was the old-fashioned lightweight pie plates that used to come in the commercially packed pies. They're very lightweight. We tie them on a string and put them around. Because they're so light, the wind moved them, which startled the animal's fright or flight instinct. 
they see movement, they run. I hear that we're having some success. Again, I'm not a gardener, but some friends of mine took up gardening, has had some success with the motion sensing sprinkler heads that when it sees motion, it shoots water and then it turns off. That scares an animal because by the time they see it, they don't know where it came from. And most animals don't really like being shot in the face with water. So there's some limited help with that. As far as the products across the country that you can buy, Ropel, um, Deer Be Gone, all of them, they're only as successful as how much you apply them and how much you're willing to spend on them to keep applying them. Because any, like even the, the dew in the morning can start washing that out. Um, so that'd be probably up to your experience with each product. Uh, next question, uh, disregard my phone. <laughs> I just moved to the reserve at Franklin Lakes. What wild animals are around here? I did see a fox during the afternoon, and what do you suggest we do? Once again, the best suggestion is enjoy it from a distance. Take a photograph. Don't approach. Don't encounter. Don't get too close to them. Give them a wide berth, and they'll give you a wide berth. The reserve is one of my favorite places to hike, and it's beautiful over there by the um, North Halden Reservoir, I guess it used to be called. I hike there regularly. I see most of the mammals in our area. I haven't encountered any bear there, but the deer is abundant because the food source is abundant. Those are the uh, remaining questions in the chat. So again, if anybody has any questions for Carol, now's the time. Okay. okay. Excellent. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight and spending your time and your attention. And once again, if you need any help, you can reach us by calling 201-652-4554 for simple questions. If you have an animal encounter that you think is dangerous or an animal is sick or injured, you notify the police department and they page us out. And of course, we have a website, TycoAnimalControlServices.com, that have a lot of questions a lot of answers to the questions people may have on a daily basis. Thank you very much, Carol. And thanks for, you know, always lending us your, your expertise. It's, it's so valuable to us, all of our community. Well, thank you. And thanks for this opportunity. Thank you, Carol. You're welcome. Thanks for setting it up, Lynette. You're welcome. Thanks for thanks, doing Carol. it. Thanks, Carol. Thank you. You're all very welcome. I enjoy it.